Who was Terra, Generation 19? Let's jump into the periodic table of history and find out. We've got 6,000 years over here on the y-axis, 4,000 BC until now. We have the equator axis where we have Ireland, Italy, Greece, Middle East, India, China, and the United States where I am. So why don't we just teleport over into the Middle East? And then also we'll zoom in here and find out who is Terra. The dates here are taken from Genesis as is. And we see the family line here starting with Shem and then coming down to Arphaxad, Sad, Sela, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Sereg, Nahor, and now Terah. Terah gets interesting because he's very close to Abraham. And Nahor lived nine and twenty years and begat Terah. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah an hundred and nineteen years and begat sons and daughters. And Terah lived seventy years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So Genesis 11 is our primary text. We can look at how they all shake out on the geography. Remember, we have five sons of Shem. And there they are. Arphaxad is in the twelfth generation. First Chronicles has the names of the genealogy. Shem, Arphaxad, Shela, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Sereg, Nahor, Terah, Abram. Luke chapter 3 proved the genealogy of Jesus Christ, so we get another reference to Terah in his gospel. We get a family travel story in Genesis 11, verse 27 to 32. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren. She had no child, and Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. So we have the family trip here from Ur of the Chaldees up here to Haran. If we zoom into this area, we can see who's up here. Peleg, Ru, Serug. Now think about what is important in your family. After you get the genealogical sequence name and date, it is nice to have stories. And one of the most popular stories are family vacations or moves. It's the same here with Terra. The detail listed is the family move. We have multiple sources of the family history. Josephus writes in a similar way of the family move. Now Abram had two brethren, Nahor and Haran. Of these, Haran left a son, Lot, as also Sarah and Milcah, his daughters, and died among the Chaldeans in a city of the Chaldeans called Ur. And his monument is shown to this day. These married their nieces, Nabor married Milcah, and Abram married Sarah. Now Terah, hating Chaldee on account of his mourning for Laran, they all removed to Haran of Mesopotamia where Terah died and was buried when he had lived to be 205 years old. For the life of man was already by degrees diminished and became shorter than before till the birth of Moses, after whom the term of human life was 120 years, God determining it to the length that Moses happened to live. The writing style of Josephus is more westernized because he was trying to write to the Romans. We see here the decreasing lifespan after the flood, and we're here observing Terah, Abraham's father. Terah lives 205 years, and we can see Nahor there, Terah there, and Abraham here. When we have them set in time, 
we can see where the birth date and the death date are. Birth date here, death date around here. And so all the patriarchs are alive when Terah is alive. Noah, Shem, you can see that they lived all the way down here. This is where Terah dies, so you can see he lived into the life of Isaac even, and Ishmael. We can see these major players along the Euphrates River. Abraham's great-grandfather, Serug, is marked as a worshiper of idols. That's cited in the Book of Jubilees. Terah is also listed as one who served other gods, as cited by Joshua, chapter 24. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old times, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. From Joshua, we observe that Terah and Abraham didn't see eye to eye. The book of Jubilees, chapter 11, sheds some light on the time of Terah. It speaks of a famine due to birds eating the seeds that people sowed on the fields. Speaking of Nahor's wife, Ijaska, Jubilees states, And she bare him Terah in the seventh year of this week. And the prince Mastema sent ravens and birds to devour the seed which was sown in the land, in order to destroy the land, and rob the children of men of their laborers. Before they could plow in the seed, the ravens picked it from the surface of the ground, and for this reason he called his name Terah, because the ravens and the birds reduced them to destitution and devoured their seed. If you didn't have an agriculture encyclopedia to tell you how to ward off birds, I suppose this could be a problem. We take many things for granted nowadays. In the book of Jasher, chapters 7, 8, and 9, we get the greatest amount of stories about Terah. Now keep in mind the book of Jasher is not canonized. It is merely interesting to get information that can't otherwise be obtained. So in this story, Terah is a mighty man of Nimrod. Terah marries, and his wife's name is Amthelo. When Terah and Amthelo have Abram, much divining and astrology of the stars happens by Nimrod, so that Nimrod sought to kill Abram. Abram is spared by Terah hiding him in a cave. After a number of years, when Abram finally comes out of the caves, he goes to the house of Shem and Noah. When Abram comes to the house of Terah, he questions the polytheism and astrology of Terah. Now, another story that is interesting to me is found in the book of Jubilees, chapter 12. Humorously, a little bratty kid named Abram goes ninja ape destruction on Terah's idol collection. Jubilees, chapter 12, states, And it came to pass in the sixth week, in the seventh year thereof, that Abram said to Terah his father, saying, Father? And he said, Behold, here I am, my son. And he said, what help and profit have we from those idols which you do worship, and before which you do bow yourself? For there is no spirit in them, for they are dumb forms, and a misleading of the heart. Worship them not. Worship Yahweh, the sovereign ruler of heaven, who causes the rain and the dew to descend on the earth, and does everything upon the earth, and has created everything by his word. And all life is from before his face. Why do you worship things that have no spirit in them? For they are the work of hands, and on your shoulders do you bear them. And you have no help from them, but they are a great cause of shame to those who make them, and a misleading of the heart to those who worship them. Worship them not. And his father said to him, I also know it, my son, but what shall I do with the people who have made me to serve before them? And if I tell them the truth, they will slay me, for their soul cleaves to them to worship them and honor them. Keep silent, my son, lest they slay you. And these words he spoke to his two brothers, and they were angry with him, and he kept silent. Later on, you find out that Abram goes on to destroy his father's idols to the dismay of Terah and the city. 
How many times does the bulk of the world just go along with pure pressure? Many of them know that what they are doing is ridiculous and unprofitable, but they are slaves. The story from Jubilees is not in the Western Bible, but interesting since it has a small dialogue of Terah. He is complicit in being part of the Nimrod slave machine. It seems Terah signed his life away at the corporation of Ur, and he knew he could eat, sleep, and be merry as long as he worshipped his dumb and stupid idol. It's very tangible and seems very human to see Abram call Terah out on this topic of idolatry. A very funny scripture is in 1 Kings chapter 18, and I encourage you to read this chapter. In this chapter, Elijah has a competition with the prophets of Baal. And in verse 27, Elijah mocks Baal, saying, When you call Baal and he doesn't answer, it must be because he is talking or pursuing, or he is in a journey or peradventure he sleepeth. Elijah has Abram's attitude. So it seems that little Abraham has this antagonistic attitude towards the dirt, rock, wood, and metal chunks of debris that people worship. And Abraham was trying to help the people by giving them freedom not to worship pieces of debris. This activity of spending exorbitant amounts of time polishing debris so you can spend more exorbitant amount of time chanting, praying, and doing yoga to the pieces of debris, total amount of time caused the people to starve. I'm reminded of my visit to Southeast Asia. In this place, the people are starving, but they have time to make images, build little houses for the gods so the birds won't dung on them, and the people go on to offer food to the pieces of polished debris. All the while, they are starving. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, My burden is light. Now, the burden of the tyrant countries, religions, and companies is not light. It is very heavy. Our countries rise or fall based upon our willingness to go along with lies. So, Terah dies here in the land of Haran, and this is where Abraham comes into the picture. Well, I choose truth, and I hope you do as well. Well, here is the total picture of history. The people at the universities choose evolutionism as their religion, but I rather go along with the simple, tangible truth that we can be free in Jesus Christ. It takes a lot of effort to search in evolutionism for tens of thousands of years of human history that in actually didn't even exist. Well, I hope these people in the Bible are becoming more tangible to you. And I thank you for watching. It's always free to subscribe, thumbs up, share, and comment. And I leave you with this quote from Emily Dickinson. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. So what are you going to do with your life? I hope it's something positive and great. Have a great week, and I will see you in the next video.